Hi there, welcome to another edition of Resistance TV. The British political class have stolen our democracy, in my opinion. I mean, we're effectively living in a one-party state these days. There's not a fight paper, is there, really, between the political parties represented in the House of Commons at the moment. I mean, they're all signed up to neoliberal economics and they're all in full to the war machine, which means whoever is in power, the status quo prevails. The parliamentary spats are meaningless performative politics, and I used to call it parliamentary parlor games when I was still an MP. Uh, there's never been a, a clearer example, in my opinion, of the gulf between the, the people and the politicians and the response to the genocide in Gaza. I mean, while the overwhelming majority of the British public sympathies with the Palestinian people, the politicians steadfastly refused to call for a ceasefire. So what are we going to do about it? Well, the resist movement, as a lot of people watching today will know, has thrown this lot in with the Workers' Party that was founded after the last general election. And I'm delighted to welcome back onto this show Steve Hall, who's one of the co-authors of the seminal book, The, the Death of the Left, this, this one here, which is a, an outstanding book and well worth a read. Um, Steve's one of an increasing number of people who've actually joined the, the Workers' Party. So I've asked Steve uh, back onto the show to explain why he's joined. So uh, hi, Steve. How are you, mate? Welcome back onto the show again. I'm fine. How are you? I'm, I'm not too bad, mate. Not too, not too bad. I've, I've just been to uh, meet up with some uh, Palestinians who uh, live in the West Bank, but they're over here at the moment. So we've uh, had a very interesting discussion with them this <laughs> afternoon. Where were yesterday? I was indeed, yes. I was there. I mean, it was huge. Uh, biggest demonstration that I've ever been involved with, actually. So it's uh, it was amazing to see. It's certainly the biggest demonstration to support the Palestinian people. But uh, anyway, so let me uh, start then. I mean, uh, well, maybe you could start by just explaining why you made the decision to, to join the Workers' Party. Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, before I begin, thanks for getting the plug in for the book early because that saves me doing it. You know, yeah, yeah, here it is. Yeah, Brilliant yeah. book. Yeah, so I can be um, less less shameless, I suppose. Than, uh, <laughs> yes, indeed. Normally. Well, no, um, seriously, I, I, I'm pleased to join the party. Um, I've been, uh, in the past, a member of the Labour Party twice, uh, throughout the 70s. Uh, I left when Kinnock came on the scene in 1983. I didn't think that he, he really represented the British working class. So um, I left, and I must um, hang my head in shame and say that I rejoined in 1997 to put... <laughs> Um, Mr. Blair in. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, a lot of people were kind, weren't they? But anyway. Because we all make mistakes, and, and, and sometimes you make a big mistake, and, uh, and that was probably the biggest mistake of, of my um, voting uh, life. And then I rejoined again. I left again, rejoined again, um, to try out Jeremy Corbyn in. And then um, uh, it left immediately when Starmer came on the scene. So I, 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 I've never really felt at home in the Labour Party. <laughs> It's pretty, uh, and and um, I, I've always uh, been on the lookout for a for a party that represents w what I feel about the world. I'm from a, a working class background in northeast of England, and I don't think that the working people are broadly conceived, the working class broadly conceived of the, of, of the um, this country, have been represented properly for about maybe fifty years. I think. Yeah, we I think the last time that we had even a semblance of representation where most of the the um, front bench and the, and the parliamentary Labour Party were of some sort of, like I said, broadly conceived working class origin of working people was probably the 1960s under Harold Wilson. But Harold Wilson showed at least some independence in, in, in the sphere of, of foreign policy by keeping it out in Vietnam. So I wanted a party that can make, I didn't agree with everything Wilson said or, or did, but I wanted to join a party that was about independent, uh, uh, about representing the working class, having independent foreign policy and an independent economic policy. I think if you, uh, just to refer to the book again, I don't know if, you, if you remember, why it's probably very eminently forget of them. <laughs> if you remember it, the final uh, chapter uh, is about it's called a return to economics, and I think that yeah, the, this the political parties in this country need to return to the economic base, 
because we're in dire straits economically. I was listening to John Gray, the conservative philosopher. I do listen to conservative because that's where you learn um, uh, the most um, appropriate critiques of your own position. Um, yeah. Saying that this country is in dire straits uh, economically, culturally, and I tend to agree with them. And the only way we can build this country back up again is, is from the economic base. We need to, to restart the British economy. We need autonomous, clean energy. We need the return of essential manufacturing. We need services that are efficient and don't funnel money into the, the pockets of private private equity corporations um, largely based in the United States of America. Uh, we need all of these things and we need to rebuild our economic base. Now, I didn't vote to leave the EU uh, because um, I thought at the time it was out of the frying pan of, an, uh, of a neoliberal institution into the fire of a global era. <laughs> you know, a, a global era. It, it was, you know, didn't make any much difference. But I did understand at the time that the fiscal credibility rule, which limits um, uh, fiscal spending to 3% of GDP, the competition laws, which ban state subsidy of industries and are, are very much against the nationalization of industries. I think there are, you know, rail and, and health service should remain, uh, rail should be nationalized uh, and uh, we could also look at energy too. So, it was an opportunity. Leaving the EU was an opportunity, and we completely failed to take that opportunity. We completely we're still in hock to global investors. We like putting bits of cheese in a mousetrap, trying to attract this this money from this huge institutional funds. These global. I don't want my, the, the the. I don't want the future of my country to be decided by BlackRock, Vanguard, Monsanto, and the rest of these global. I want the people of this country to have a hand in their own destiny. Uh, the only party that, that um, comes anywhere near, um, you know, uh, a, a manifesto, um, a, a, you know, that's concerned with the rebuilding of that economic base is the Workers' Party. So that's the principal reason I joined. I have to yeah. say, and you might not like this, but the SDP also has a reasonable economic manifesto but um, uh, there are some of the cultural attitudes of the SDP that, that, that I find a little bit um, distasteful. Um, mm -hmm. But if we are going to be an electric, electoral force, I know you said the electrical force there, but I, I mean, maybe we do need a bit more energy. But if we go to be an electoral force, then we may, we may have to think in the future about forging alliances on economic issues only. If you have back the economy, that is the sphere in which we can forge alliances. That's the sphere in which we can reach the public. Six, over 60% of the public would agree with nationalizing rail, for instance, and they would agree with mm. nationalizing energy, given the, the ludicrous increase in the energy prices of you know, domestic and industrial uh, energy prices. So the Workers' Party fits the bill for me, and it wants an independent foreign policy. As you said in your introduction, I don't want to be part of the American. I don't really want to be a stooge in the American. War machine. I think yeah. we should be able to make decisions like Wilson did in, uh, I think it was 1967, they made a decision not to go into Vietnam. And that was a very wise decision. As we all know, eight years later, the Americans pull out of Vietnam after having so many deaths. I can't remember the number of deaths. I think it was up to 30,000 Americans dead. They're absolutely not. To try to force a bunch of Vietnamese farmers into their own ideological way of thinking and doing politics. Some of the Vietnamese, whether they're communists, socialists, or whatever, so that's, that, it's their decision. It's got nothing to do with this. And so well, indeed. I mean, I mean, one of the uh, the key points in the 10-point plan uh, or the 10-point program is, is uh, you know, support for an anti-imperialist stance, uh, sure. you know, uh, against being against uh, NATO. I know that uh, you looked at the Workers' Party's... Uh, a 10 point uh, uh, program uh, for workers. Um, and, you know, and I think that's what persuaded you in the end to join the Workers' Party. Was there anything in the in the 10 point plan that you that particularly stood out that you, that you found in, was in important? Foreign policy in the refurbishment of the British economy and the yeah. duration of services it's so that we have efficient nationalized services that work 
you know, up until very recently, the NHS was voted the most popular and efficient health service in the world. And that would think before um, Cameron's Conservatives got in. Uh, so what's changed? Obviously, the Tories are they're running it down, privatising, outsourcing, making it less efficient. Uh, they're not coping with the ageing population we have. We need a huge amount of investment in the uh, in the NHS. And we can only do that with, it, with a properly nationalised service, properly funded. And I think the the other interesting um, aspect of the uh, of the um, workers' party is that they're willing to listen to heterodox alternative economic thinking. And I know you're very keen on that yourself, Chris. In fact, you're speaking at Congress about it, aren't you? About uh, modern monetary theory. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask you, uh, uh, Steve, just in terms of the uh, the ten point uh, program. Uh, the the Workers Party uh, has published, and it talks about obviously you know, good working conditions, yeah. proper decent pay for for workers, bringing the uh, utilities back into public o- ownership, uh, yeah. good low cost, secure housing for for everybody, uh, your high quality free preschool, uh, childcare and education. Following that, you know, be being sort of a high quality, high quality, you know higher vocational training, um, you know, uh, free comprehensive health care, no waiting lists and all the rest of it, um, a range of other things. But, you know, when we uh, talk about that, uh, often when we get, if we get the opportunity, uh, and certainly when Labour were, you know, certainly under Jeremy Corbyn anyway, and, and even before that, talking about improving public services and, uh, you know, basically introducing policies that benefit the working class, you're often met with the uh, retort from the corporate media hacks, well, how are you going to pay for it? So obviously there's a big kind of commitments there to, as I've said, you know, good quality working conditions, decent pay, renationalization, you know, kicking the privateers out of the health service, getting rid of the waiting list and so on and so forth, uh, free vocational and higher education. Um, how would you... You know, well, how would you respond to that? I mean, and you know, how do you think the Workers' Party should be responding to that? Well, you know, in terms of how you're going to pay for it. Yeah, I think one of the great myths of, of neoliberal economic uh, thinking, if uh, one can describe it as thinking, it, it, it is that um, the state can't forge stuff, and that it hasn't that, 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 that there's a finite amount of money, um, which is uh, basically the result of um, returning taxes. It needs tax revenue in order to, to spend uh, on services, um, on, on defence and, and all of the other things the state must have. But that's a complete myth. In fact, the all nations are currency issuing nations. When we left the Bret Woods uh, arrangement in, in, in uh, 19, early 1970s, we adopted fiat currency economy, so fiat uh, they're not. They're not. They're not based in on gold. Uh, they're not based on other types of, of assets, either. So we can produce, issue as much currency as we want, up to the level of inflation. Now, there's something about neoclassical economics that rides roughshod over the basic laws of supply and demand. Inflation happens, doesn't it, when there's too much money around and not enough stuff. Yeah? So if yeah. you have a field with a goat in and you issue a pound, the goat's worth a pound. If you issue two pounds, then the, the, the seller of the goat knows you can get that for it, and the pound's cut in half. The value of the pound, but goat's going to cost two pounds. Yeah? The very, very basic, simple laws of supply and demand. The way to prevent inflation is not to reduce the money supply, is not to, not to raise interest rates, collapse businesses, make people's mortgages unaffordable, all the rest of it is to increase supply, to, to, to match the amount of money in circulation. Yes? Yeah. Now, we can only increase supply with investment. And the problem is that since the 1970s, this country, particularly this country, and other countries in Europe too, and, and parts of the United States of America, have suffered from what we might call an investment strike. 
Now, the, the, the right-wing press has always complained about workers going on strike. Well, the investors have gone on strike, and they went on strike in the 1970s. They refused to invest. And it's not just in the 1970s. If you look at the um, British industry from 1945 onwards, they, 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 that suffered from a complete, uh, it's an awful uh, lack of investment. I remember working in concert steelworks in the 1970s, and we had a diaphragm pump uh, on the um, uh, water circulation plant where I worked. It was all technical stuff. Um, and it had 1948 stand on it. That, that pump was put there in 1948. It had never been replaced. That was there in 1975. I went on a deputation of German steelworks in Essen. You could eat your dinner off the floor. You know, there were early computers yeah. in that control. You know, people were clean and they, they, they had new machinery. And it was, it was you know, it was... Yeah. Germany was... Japan were chosen as investment shock absorbers by the Americans. So in other words, you know, if the downturns elsewhere, they can always pump money into Germany and Japan and make, and make sure they get returns on their investment. Since then, they've expanded to Taiwan and China, Indonesia, you name it, anywhere but the UK. Mm. It suffer from a serious lack of investment. When COVID hits and we foolishly, I think, I mean, I don't know, I, I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm not a medic, I don't know whether the, the response to COVID was a good one or a bad one. The Swedes seem to go for herd immunity and come out with the same sort of figures as we do. Yeah, I don't, I don't know whether whether the, the, the um, vaccines were were a corporate fiddle or not. And that, you know, I do. Well, they certainly made a lot of uh, money out of it. The big yeah. farmer did. I mean, there's no I doubt. Be, I could be persuaded that way. <clears throat> and a couple of that, a good friend of mine, Thomas Batsy, the Italian economist, and 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 an academic called Chervy Green from um, London have written a very good book about that called The COVID Consensus, and they certainly come down on that side. Yeah. But what we yes. discovered during that, that lockdown, whether it was a good idea or not, it probably was, it wasn't, <laughs> uh, what we discovered was that we, we, we lack essential manufacturing. We couldn't even manufacture our own syringes or masks. You know, it was absolutely ludicrous. There were what once was the workshop of the world in the 1860s, Manchester was making three quarters of the world's material products. They had trend. Yeah. We have fallen and declined. And the reason for that is lack of investment. I believe it's because, from what I've read, uh, 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 it, from the American politicians in the 50s and 60s, it's because America didn't want competition. This, this, is, this, this was a high-tech, highly skilled industrial nation, the first in the world. We invented this. Even like the matter, for God's sake, you know, this was yeah. the world. First industrial nation, and yeah. we carried on. Then we could have, we had the scales, we had the techniques to move into a green economy and, and, to, and to develop clean energy, mm. and all the rest of it. But we suffered from lack of investment, and for some reason, the British political class did what the Americans showed them. And the British, well, that, the city of London is one of the world's largest financial centres, and it refused yeah. to invest in its own. Industry. Now, the Labour Party manifesto of 1907, yeah, it was the best Labour Party manifesto I've ever read because they would get to use North Sea oil revenue to refurbish. This was Ben and Peter Shaw, do you remember Peter Shaw? I do, and, I do, yeah. Yeah, they were going to use North Sea oil revenue to refurbish British industry, both public and private. British Labour would probably have to go, it was a bad idea to try and manufacture the state manufactured cars. Just, car, car industry is like fashion industry, it moves too fast for the state. It was probably better off. Yeah, um, uh, investing in private uh, companies for, for for cars, but rail, energy, and all the rest of it could have remained in in, in, uh, in the government under the government's control and be completely refurbished. Why didn't we do that? The American. I mean, I think. I mean, I think. I mean, one of the things that Tony Benn was also very keen on was uh, worker cooperatives, and indeed, in the manifesto that uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, spearheaded in in 2017 uh you know there was that commitment to the, the so-called right to own where their company was being sold they were talking about giving workers the right to buy out the company and providing the finance through the uh national investment or regional investment banks that they were talking about creating i, I said they should go further and uh, any company that was uh, thinking of offshoring to which we've seen a lot of uh, that hiding, uh, off, offshoring its jobs to, to low wage economies, uh, that workers should be given the right in those circumstances to to buy out the company. I mean, is that a 
do you think a better model of, of public ownership? I mean, you talked about British Leyland. Uh, I mean, if it was the workers had a proper stake in it, maybe, maybe it would have made a better list of things. It could have been devolved into various cooperatives, you know, but like, like I say, it had to be more fleet-footed because the car industry was, was becoming the fashion industry. Well, if you remember Red Robbo, Derek Robinson, I mean, one of the things uh, that obviously he was, you know, pushed out, but one of the things he was calling for was a, you know, massive investment in the volume car manufacturing industry, of which he was the chief uh, shop steward at uh, Leyland, because um, he was saying if you're going to compete with the, the likes of Volkswagen and, uh, and some of these other, you know, volume car manufacturers uh, in Europe at that point in time, and uh, I think Jeff Howard just coming on the scene then, uh, then, you know, they weren't in a fit. They weren't in the right place to be able to do that. It needed huge, huge investment. And, uh, and of course, that wasn't forthcoming, was it? And we saw what happened. The, the industry shrunk and, you know, we're, we're basically now building cars under license from Japan. When after the Second World War, the Japanese were building British cars under license. Uh, you know, from, so things have kind of turned, been turned on the head, haven't they? But they have. I mean, in principle, I, I'm all for cooperatives. I like the idea of cooperatives and I like the idea of worker control. But the problem is that without some um, control over aggregate demand, the worker cooperatives can turn into self-exploitation. You know, if you're not selling stuff, if the market's tight and you can't be yeah, yeah. no, no, okay, yeah. no better position than you would be if you had a boss. You know, no, 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 no. Do what we have to do. I think this is what MMT gets right. And I, um, I'll talk a minute for a minute about MMT for me, if you don't mind, but just to say initially. That MMT gets right because the core of all economies is finance. Without finance and investment, without currency issue and investment, you can't do anything. All companies need constant investment and reinvestment, and they need constant credit. We 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 found out in the Near East four and a half thousand years ago that credit means that economies can grow faster. Without credit, you have to make stuff, sell it, get the money, and reinvest it. How do you do that if you haven't got the money in the first place to pay for labor and materials? Mm. So economies for, for thousands of years were stagnant, and it was credit that allowed economies, large-scale economies, to grow quick. And this is when, of course, um, Palace economies were, were, were um, able to issue currency to circulate and pay people and pay for pay for materials. So we know that credit is essential for economies. And credit, we need for investment. We also need to spend money in, in, into, exi into existence uh, through, through uh, you know, wages and, 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 and through government spending in order to make sure enough money is circulating to keep aggregate demand up to the required level. Supply must meet that demand, so it's up to us to invest us enough of that money in the um, boosting of, of supply to make sure that we don't cause inflation. Now, I, yes, don't, I don't think MMT is watertight. No. I think there are problems regarding taxation, inflation. I don't think the foreign exchange markets are as powerless as some of the MMT economists it's all about, you know, the credit rating agencies and, uh, and the money traders are very, very powerful players in the market, especially when they're playing tradable bonds. You know, there are two types of bonds and something you can trade. And they can, if you like, degrade us, you know, they, 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 they can do that. So these are issues, I think, that we need to be hammered out between MMT economists, both Kenyans, uh, you know, like people like Steve Keen, Mar Mariana Matsukuda. Uh, I'd be out. Pronounced her name, mispronounced her name there. Uh, and the, my own the Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Whether well, the entrepreneurial state uh, author. Yes. Uh, we, yeah. We, need to, yeah. we need to build an alliance of economists around a broad left um, fulcrum in order to start hammering these things out. I don't think MMT on its own. Uh, it's very. It's not particularly good at spreading its message. The MMT activists, activists work very, very odd, and I have huge respect for them. <clears throat> but you're not going to attract support by trying to give people accountancy lessons online. No, no, indeed, indeed, indeed. I understand that. I, but like, uh, oh. like Winston Churchill said, I mean, you know, it's about democracy, you know, it's, it's the worst form of government by all the others that's been. 
kind. Of, you know, and maybe, you know, MMG, but local MMG is uh, more than monetary theory. It's just a lens. It's just understanding it, how the it, monetary it, system yeah. operates. It's not, it's not an ideology in that sense. It's, it's got a neutral uh, political you know. ideological. Because if it doesn't for if it doesn't foreground what it can actually do for people, yeah? Yeah, yeah so no, indeed, yeah. <laughs> Let me just show you another book, actually. Um, Hang on. Let me just show you this one if I can. Uh, yeah, uh, there we go. Oh, is this Fiat Socialism? Car- Fiat Socialism, yeah. Uh, yeah. The old Carlos Hernandez sort of talks about, you know, how uh, an under- using MMT as a lens could, could maybe be, you know, help to deliver a oh, sort it's okay. of... Uh... It's okay as a lens, but we'll, 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 we, we need something to, to attract um, support from... from but... Oh, yeah, yeah, I know, no, absolutely, absolutely, but... Oh, these yellows, yeah. Uh, the yeah. Keep telling people that taxes don't pay public spending, and they go, "Oh well, so they go, oh well, you well, might be right, you might not be." They don't know, and they don't have the inclination to go through all of the complex macro and economic theory in order to come to a conclusion and make up their minds. What we're going yeah. to do is track people into it first with, with promises, and those promises have to revolve around jobs. I know MMT. Um, it's based around a job guarantee promise, which is a good thing. All of this stuff needs to go at the front. We need the refurbishment of industry, investment, jobs, clean energy, autonomous. All of this stuff needs to go at the forefront. And unfortunately, it isn't. If you just use MMT as a lens, which is Warren Mosler's position, he said MMT could be used by any political party. Well, yeah. if you say that, then the, the, the Americans, they're not going to do MMT. What have we been doing MMT? Oh, no, they do. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. But in your book, uh, though, I mean, I think you do say it out uh, very, very effectively. It, it, yeah, you know. the best of a bad bunch. No, some yeah. people, you say the best of a mediocre bunch, I think. Uh, but together, I think MMT with both post Keynesianism and other positions on the broad left could hammer out something feasible, something attractive. And I'm part of a new group, a um, uh, discussion group on that new political economy, which is trying to put MMT and other um, heterodox positions into a sort of political frame in order to um, help parties such as ours, and I, I'm doing it now, uh, ours, yeah, yeah. forward a very, very attractive economic package to try to get people, more people. Well, look, I mean, the Workers' Party is um, you know, going to have a, a session on this uh, in January, actually, where I'm going to a special session looking at, you know, economics in that sense and looking at how, you know, MOT can be used as a tool to kind of, as it were, explain our program and how it could be uh, delivered. But I wonder, uh, Stephen, well, but it might be sort of worth going through some of the the, uh, the, the, the individual 10-point plan um, program uh, and just sort of getting your thoughts about it. I mean, the very first one, I think we've already mentioned this, about, you know, it's anti appearance sort of stance, but it's also withdrawal from NATO. I mean, um, just say a bit about that, what are your thoughts on that? Because, you know, you get some people saying, well, if you withdraw from NATO, you know, they'll leave uh, Britain defenceless and, uh, you know, we, we could be attacked by our enemies. I mean, what's your thoughts about that but very first uh, uh, point of the 10-point plan? Well, first of all, we're not defenceless. And we could refurbish our defence for uh, our armed forces uh, uh, into a, a purely defensive force quite easily. We can with investment. This comes back to our investment in economics. And secondly, we don't have any enemies uh, apart from those who were caused by NATO. NATO was the cause of, uh, of the enemy. Uh, if, 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 you know, if NATO support the current um, genocide in, and let's call it what it is, it's genocide in, in Gaza, and if Arabs and Muslims become really angry about that, and I don't think that's, a, you know, I, I, I just think there's a, any argument about that, they're becoming increasingly angry about that, then we become a target. We are supporting a belligerent imperialist, set up that works principally for the benefit of the United States of America and its its financial um, elite. So NATO causes the enmity. When NATO destroyed Libya, NATO destroyed Iraq. They were all NATO countries, anyway, not all of them joined in, but, but they're all NATO countries who are doing this. The NATO destroyed Yugoslavia. So any enmity we get, the first Islamic terrorist attack well, the first serious one in this country was in 2005. So that was two years after the invasion of Iraq. Now, it's obvious to anyone looking at that time scale that this is blowback. We're not getting Islamic terrorism uh, in, in this country because there's some 
a caliphate wanting to, to, to turn back the clock and invade Europe again. You know, we're not going to have the Battle of Fortier or the Battle of Vienna again, you know, because the, 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 Islam wants to invade Europe. This was blowback because we had destroyed uh, an Islamic country. It was a barbarous country, which, as you know, was, a, was about pan-Arabic um, socialism. Uh, and it was, uh, uh, you know, something that the Americans didn't want. It was hostile to Israel. You remember the Scud missiles falling on Tel Aviv? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So we're doing the bidding of America and Israel. Well, yeah. we'll be able to choose whose bidding we do. And one of our members at NATO was signed up to do whatever the Americans decide. And they also, you know, they make these decisions in conjunction with Israel. We all know that. Yeah, so, yeah we do. And then we need to decide who we support and how we support them. And if we have yeah. sort of armed forces I'm talking about, which would be purely defences, then, then I don't think we would be able to support them. I, I don't believe in, in, in reducing the armed forces. I think we should, yeah. have a, a, we should have a functioning, efficient Air Force, Navy and a land forces. Yeah. What one that's not, not in thrall to uh, the United States and, uh, and, and NATO? Off in the foreign climbs and do what the Americans tell yeah. us, but defend this country. Yeah. Maybe deterrent, that's to be discussed. Yeah. Uh, personally, I believe we should retain deterrent because yeah. I think uh, for purely defensive purposes, and I think we must do that. I think to, to get rid of that at the present time would be quite would be quite dangerous. Yeah, so I mean, I take a, I take a different uh, view on that myself, and frankly, I think our nuclear deterrent we, we could never use it. Well, we need the Americans say so, and if he did use it, then you know, well, there's no for, for use, everybody. You know. can't use it. I know it sounds, yeah. but you, you know, my mutually assured destruction means that you can't use it. No, no, indeed, but... a very long time. I don't know what what would have happened with a unilateral armament if only one side had them. What would have happened? Mm-hmm. Already, the Americans dropped them on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely good, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. With that mutually assured destruction, we just don't know what would have happened. I'm not sure, I, you could be right, you could be absolutely, I could be totally wrong, but I'm not sure I'd want, to, I'd want to take that risk at the moment. We've got it, and I think I'd retain it for the time being, because the world's changing. The geopolitical world is changing, we know that. We're moving from a unipolar to a multipolar world. Uh, the new powers are rising in the East, Russia, whether like it or not, Russia... China, India is is hedging its bets. Modi's very much still um, uh, 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 very much still a servant of neoliberalism, uh, and the, he's sort of wavering. But certainly China, Russia, Brazil, uh, uh, South Africa, uh, and you know there's a possibility that they might um, set up a reserve currency over the next few years. It's going to that's going to be a long struggle to do so. They're starting to trade in. They're using their own currencies. They're not so reliant upon the dollars they once were. They're rising. And guess what? When, when the American private equity companies were, weren't, weren't investing in this country, they were investing in China. What else did they expect? Did they expect China to remain as a subservient sweatshop? Well, for American that, that, corporations? That's that they, colonial mindset, isn't it? Stupid, are they? Did they not, could they not see that China was going to rise and become powerful? Yeah, I don't what they're yeah. And good on them because that's what, you know, that's what they should do. Anyone who. No, we do. With well, China, China's, as you know, lifted uh, nearly a billion people out of uh, poverty. So, I mean, it's, you know, they're doing something right. And so, the Road Initiative, they're getting better deals from the Chinese, be- other countries are getting better deals from the Chinese Belt Road Initiative than they ever got from the Americans because the Americans are purely extracted. They go and, yes. they, and then they, they go. At least the Chinese, I'm no fan, Chris, of the British Empire. Yeah. But at least we built a few railways and a few. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? You know, it, it, it was a for, it was a for exchange really for what we uh, what we uh, uh, London. Well, the, uh, yeah, the Americans yeah. no exchange at all. No, well, yeah, they, 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 they. How honest and the Chinese are with the Belt Road Initiative. There are stories of railways in East Africa yeah, building them, but they don't work properly and then approving it. I don't know about that. Well, this would be you know, we need to investigate case by case. But I'm pretty sure that the, the, the um, African countries, for instance, are getting better the deal from the Belt Road Initiative. I think that was pretty, that's pretty, you know, contentious, really, I think. But uh, let me just remind you of the other points, though, in, in the 10-point uh, plan, and I just want to get your thoughts on them. I mean, they're decent, cheap, secure... De- a decent, uh, cheap, secure housing for all is uh, a key 
you know, one of the key, key points in the in the program. Just say a bit about you know why you think that's important, how we and how we deliver it. Well, because we're moving into what Yanis Varoufakis calls a a, rent, a a rentier economy, techno feudalism. We're moving in into a, a, an economy in which oligarchs, a huge co- co- companies, huge corporations are buying up land, building housing for rent. It's, it's just buy to rent, basically, or build to rent. And we should be doing this. Local authorities should be building housing because that worked throughout the 1950s and 1960s. It went wrong in the 1960s when they started building these obscene concrete tower blocks. It went wrong. But we've got to do it right again. Now, I think the local authorities should be building affordable, good quality housing for the working people of Britain. What they need yeah. to do well, again, we're back to the same thing again. Well, but all roads lead to investment. And we yeah. need the ACU currency. When you make a house, you increase supply. Yeah? And therefore, you don't cause inflation. As long as you increase supply, as long as you're making stuff people want, and the money supply is is tailored to, to, to the, the supply, the aggregate demand is tailored to that supply, then you won't cause inflation. We can do that. We didn't cause inflation after the war by building huge amounts of council houses. And so we yeah, need we do. do that. And what we need to encourage private building firms if uh, to um, build houses that are going to last. Are these houses they're building going to last? I'm not sure. But, uh, they are a variable quality. I think that there are different parts of the market where then some of the stuff they're building is quite good quality and other stuff where they're replacing local authority housing. They're building worse housing than, than the local authorities built in the 50s up until the, yeah. the, the demise in the 60s. So we, we must create affordable housing for everyone in this country. Homelessness should not be an issue in what are we this? Not sixth largest economy in the world. I think we're the sixth now. Aren't we? Sixth now, yeah. Yeah, homelessness should not be an issue. People shouldn't be living in damp flats and paying exorbitant rents to landlords when local authorities are perfectly capable of building good quality housing. That yeah. should, of course, well, you remember as well as I do, one of the um, attractive part and parts of Thatcherism was to buy shares and buy your own house. Oh yeah, the share share shareholding um, uh, home owning uh, uh, democracy she referred to, didn't she? And uh, of course that all went completely pear shaped. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's also you know it's a very important key key uh, pledge. As is the commitment in the workers' uh, uh, ten point plan to uh, treat free, fully uh, well cheap or or free, uh, fully integrated. Uh, public uh, transport systems uh, and indeed access to all amenities, water, sanitation, heating, electricity, post office, telephone, and internet, etc. Um, of course, yeah. all these things are in the are in the private uh, sector now. Um, I remember the time we had passenger executive, passenger transport executive. I live up in 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 Newcastle. The time we had passenger the yellow buses, they were all over the place. They were on time. They were modern and they worked. Yeah, uh, the the shady walls worked, and you didn't see empty buses all the time. So they were properly planned. Everything was integrated, integrated with the metro system that was built in the nineteen seventies. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Now we're paying. Now the the, the local authority through the state subsidies, local authority subsidies are subsidising private homes. So we're actually putting public money into the pop in the pockets of people who who, are, who own. And guess who owns all of these massive transport corporations? Well, it's the same private equity corporations, isn't it? This country is simply uh, a, a funnel that goes into the pockets of private equity corporations, private equity corporations such as BlackRock, for instance, uh, such as you see all these McCarthy Stone buildings going up all over the place. I think they're 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 owned by private equity corporations as well. It's more wrong here for you know yeah. old, old, old folk to go in and, and, and rent these. Exorbitant prices, or buy them and exor- uh, buy them exorbitant prices. We're funneling money into public money into the pockets of the private entrepreneurs. Where we do deals with private entrepreneurs, and I think we do need some uh, measure of private business. I mean, we can't. The state can't run anything, Chris. I think we need to to, to move on from from that. The state can't run everything. That was the failure. The failure. 
But then everyone talked about human rights and everything, about the Soviet Union, all the rest of it, but, but which is some of it was true. But what really kiboshed the, the Soviet Union was Gosplan. You know, Gosplan was the central command office in Moscow, which tried to control the, eco the, the economy of a mass if you, you can't do that, especially before the age of computers and, 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 and mobile phones. You just can't do that. There are tales of queues in a, a shop in Vladivostok waiting for bacon or sausages and a lorry load of mid tan boot polish or something turn up, you know, because someone has made a mistake. The state can run what the state can run best utilities transport, energy, the state can run the big stuff, but we need to encourage small business We need uh, to run small stuff like cafes, food shops, and all the rest of the small independent businesses. That way, as um, Dan Evans, I don't know if you've read Dan Evans' book, but it's Dan Evans is a Welsh socialist. I own the book, and I, 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 my brain's getting ill. The title of the book's completely gone out of my head, but it's yeah. a it's about the sort of petty bourgeoisie, yeah? The small business, the builders and shop owners who always vote conservative. But they shot themselves in the foot by doing that because conservative policies, which are neoliberal policies, of course, which are raising interest rates, cutting, uh, you know, reducing the money supply, cutting aggregate demand, means that they struggle more than anyone else under conservative neoliberal policies. And I think that to attract those people they work as just the same as they just happen to work from the, for themselves. Some of the Dan's pals are sort of local builders. Well, I know a couple of my pals are local builders too because they're workers. They're mobile entrepreneurial workers. They've done their own building firms and they get around doing jobs. So we yeah. need to attract these people. They're workers just the same as us. And I think Dan Evans has, has a point. So we need to broaden out a little bit and we need to move a little bit with the times. But the state no doubt it can run the big stuff like energy transport and all the rest of it so we have to work we have to work carefully um uh, with you know the times move on and, and, and times change so so we have to be a little bit careful yeah i mean was it uh, a nation of shopkeepers of just uh, shopkeepers yeah 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 indeed i mean one of the other things that uh i wanted to get your thoughts on in relation to the 10 point plan was this sort of access to uh easy access as well to uh, culture and uh, and media. I mean, just say a bit about why you think that's important. Yeah, well, years, years ago, when I was an academic <clears throat> and uh, first starting in the, in, in, in the 1980s, I started uh, rather late. I was a professional musician for a number of years and started. Uh, we can see the guitars in the back there. Oh, they're still there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I still have a bit of the plot now and again, go out and play. Yeah, yeah good. Excellent. <clears throat> Nothing serious, just uh, fun and enjoyment these days. Um, I'd, rather, I'd, I'd rather not go back try and make a living out of the gallows. No. Never better try and make a living out of something you love. But anyway, what was I saying? Uh, um, so well, just in terms of access to uh, culture and, and media, I mean, one yeah, of the commitments of the... Uh, of the... Um, well, I, I, I taught uh, some media studies. I taught in the criminology department, but as a sociologist and social theorist, uh, I knew off quite a lot about communication and media studies. And then there was all focused on what we call the ownership and control debate. Who owns the media? Who controls? You know, that's the old-fashioned notion that the media sets the agenda. And through this, this complex term called hegemony, which, which means that cultural output is it basically supports existing ruling elite ideas. Yeah, so we were taught the ownership and control. Since then, since the 1980s, more and more media have come under con corporate control. Now, there are only two large corporations that own and control all of the record labels that you, you, you get in the music. Spotify pays... Each artist, I know this because I've got a few jazz tracks up on Spotify. <laughs> Nobody listening. Oh, well, I must tell them them up then. <laughs> uh, yeah. But um, we get something like, I don't quote me on this, I can't remember the exact figure, but something like 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.0003 of a pound for a play. Wow. Now, I've got, I've got some um, stuff up on there with 30,000 listens lately, and I was paid about 90 pounds. 
Now, just imagine if I was a pal to listen, you know. Oh, yeah. You'd be a wealthy man. Just run terrorism. Basically, what the culture and media industries are doing is stealing people's products, putting them on their platforms. This is what's called platform capitalism. Yeah, putting them on the platforms and renting them out and taking the money and giving giving arts to pittance. They're owning and controlling culture and, and media. Well, is that something and you think that it should be run by the state then? I think that the state could regulate or take over those media platforms. Yeah. I think probably better regulating it, regulating them and subsidizing some. Yes? Yeah. Think, yeah. I think the problem is that the, all of the state subsidies at the moment go to classical music and opera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't get those sort of forms. That is an art form. You don't get any you jazz musician, or you know, you, you, if you grew yeah. on commercial prospect. Me, commercial prospect, like my age, no. Well, yeah. <laughs> never say never, comrade. <laughs> never say never. No, don't tell yeah. me. But, but yeah. um, no, I, the, the only ship and control of the media is, is in private hands. There's no doubt. Newspapers, there, there isn't an, an independent democratic newspaper in, in, in the country. They're all privately owned. Even The Guardian, um, I think it was in 2008, again, don't quote me on the year, but the Scott Trust turned into the Scott Trust Limited. Yeah. And the Scott Trust Limited means, again, it's private corporate control. So The Guardian starts singing from the hymn sheet, or neoliberal hymn sheet, because that's it, because that's what's advertised. Uh, but I mean, you know, the, 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 the um, you know, the, the pledge in the, uh, in the Tempo Plan, you, you know, you talk about access to uh, culture and media. What about, uh, you know, theatre and so on? I mean, what's your thoughts about, well, I think you know, people's the, access? It was certainly something the state could run and, and the local authorities could run because we had a very good theatre in, 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 in two in Newcastle, run by um, a Newcastle Playhouse and the People's Theatre, run, run by local authorities and, and trust. And, and they were cheap access uh, for good quality um, theatre productions. And we also had a place called Riverside, which was subsidised by the local authority, which was a, a sort of um, left field pop venue. We had yellow bands like uh, Ian Jury and the Bloggers playing there in the 1980s. So, yeah, yeah. You know, the alternative to the to the commercial stuff you hear on radio, although they were on the radio as well, it became quite popular. But it was a little left, more left field, and it was the place said, yes, I think the local authorities through state subsidy can get involved in um, in good quality uh, culture, uh, cultural venues, and make them uh, accessible and cheap so that people can afford to go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just just one other point on that. I mean, it's not in the uh, uh, the ten point uh, uh, plan, uh, but obviously it, that's a living document, and as the Workers' Party develops, obviously a policies will develop. But um, yeah. you know, one of the things that uh, I'm quite passionate about is uh, as a new settlement for local government. And obviously, local government has been starved of, of funds, and it's very uneven, actually, around the country. I mean, you know, you go down south, and they've, they've had their fair share of cuts, but they're not as impacted as the Midlands and the North are. One of the things that brought this home to me, nothing to do with uh, what I'm just going to ask you about in a moment, was, um, I mean, I, I uh, present a, a, a program about Palestine, and uh, I was looking actually, as I was driving to the studio one day, uh, I noticed that they were refurbishing the pavements and they were paved, and they were refurbishing or re replacing them with, with, with flagstones, you know? We haven't done that in Derby or many local authorities that I'm aware of, for, unless it's in the city centre or some, you know, important location. For well, 30 or more years, they just put a bit of tarmac down. They only put tarmac down, they do this thing called slurry ceiling, it's like a watered-down tarmac. Um, but the point is, I was going to make is that you know, local authorities across the piece have, have had massive reductions in the in the finance available to them. As I say, it is all even. But one of the you know when the cuts started really biting, the one of the first things to go were things like the theatre. They were kind of like outsourced to sort of private sector or to you know in our case in Derby, the the university uh, took it over. Um, do you think, therefore, I mean, how do we kind of, you know, deal with that? Because, I mean, at the minute, uh, the way it's been forever, really, is that local authorities are at the mercy of central government, you know? Um, and if the central government has it in its uh, 
mind to make uh, massive cutbacks in local government funding, uh, then you know they are in a in a difficult place, and and they're also you know subject to the vagaries of of the whims of ministers and so on. I mean, do you think there's a there's a case for um, you know more of a, of a sort of an autonomous local government, um, an ability to to raise finance in, independently, to issue bonds, to to finance capital works and so on, or are you more of a centralizer? I don't think there's any need to do that because I think that the um, states claim that they can't afford to subsidise what local authorities need to do. And again, based on the same neoliberal logic of um, of taxes paying for public spending. In fact, the state can afford to subsidise local authorities as much as they need as long as they are producing services and goods that people want to buy. This is, again, basic supply and demand. Paving? The whole country needs repaving. It's sinister. Yeah, yeah, after all, yeah. Especially pavements with trees uh, growing, you know, they're all breaking. Yeah. The rest of it. I remember cultural venues all over Newcastle. The Buddle Arts Centre drove past that the other day. Too. It was a vibrant, lively um, a cultural centre, an arts centre, uh, subsidised by, by the local authority. It's all boarded up and falling apart. I was actually quite yeah. That one, I see, because we used to play there every, every month at the Buddle Arts Centre. There are services that are desperately needed. There are cutbacks to children's services. There are cutbacks right across the board. The fact is that the state can afford these. This is simply neoliberal ideology. It's a, it's, it's a belief system. And the reason that belief system exists is that it doesn't... There's a principle here, Chris. There's a principle that we can see in their original documents from the Walter Lippmann Colloquium in 1938, right through the 1950s, when neoliberalism was, in, in, in fact, a rather marginal political... Oh, yeah. yeah. It, took, it took a lot of decades for it to actually get into power because, the, uh, you know, Keynesianism was the orthodoxy from the, from the end of the war and from indeed, America, from the Roosevelt beat us to the punch. I mean, he adopted Keynesian policies in 1933 and we get like so that was the other that worked up to a certain extent it worked the principle is this okay according to the neoliberal ideology the state must never be a be seen to be able to do something that the market can't do and the reason for that is that when currency is issued by the state there are two ways to issue it through interest-free state spending and investment MMT economists don't like to make the distinction between spending and investment. They, they, they say it's the same thing. I do like to make it. It's another argument I have with MMT. Because I think investment is a more attractive idea. That people will people see investment as something for the future, whereas spending is profligacy in, in, in the present. You see what I mean? I think MMT, I mean, they're, they're politically and ideologically naive. They need to, to, to put their right. Uh, so I, I like to make that distinction. But... The other way to issue currency is through private bank loans. Now, people think that when a bank makes a loan, it simply get, it t takes some money out of a pot that its customers have saved and lends that money out. That's the savings and loan ideology. It's complete nonsense. Banks don't lend out customers' savings. They keep those save it, savings for clearance and settlement and what we call interbank lending, which is lending to each other. Very yeah, well. yeah. Remember when that Barclays guy was sacked? I, I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. That's what, <laughs> that's what they're, they get up to all sorts of stuff. Nobody understands it, Chris. That, that, that's the problem. Now, yeah. what happens when a bank makes a loan, and the Bank of England will verify this, and that they've got a document, it's a some way, I've got it on the, on the computer, so I'll send it to you if you want, where they verify what happens, which is that, the, that, that the Treasury, they have permission to do this, the Treasury, Credits the bank's reserve account at the central bank, and that creates more money. It, it puts more money into circulation. They're expanding the money supply as they make loans. Yes, of course. Yeah. No, indeed. I mean, you know, they, 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 these things are. Uh... That's their business. So they, yes, yeah. all money that's put into circulation, all investment, all spending to be private. So it goes yeah. to the business, and they can, um, they, they can trouser the in. Now, yeah. after the Second World War, we had a much better balance between public, it, it, it publicly issued currency, state currency, and privately um, 
you know, with, 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 the state didn't issue all currency in rest free that private banks operate, but we had a much better balance. And this is how we set up the NHS. This is how we could keep the steel in the, you know, we nationalized steel in the late sixties. We do all sorts of things and also maintain a reasonable defense force. Um, and all of the things that we need because the state was allowed to spend. It didn't cause rampant inflation. In fact, that rampant inflation only appeared on the scene. It was starting to rise a little bit in the late 1960s, late 1960s for reasons. Where, yeah. uh, we can com complicate reasons we can go into, but it really hyped up after 1973. Guess what? It was a rise in energy prices. Yeah, remember the other? Yeah, yeah the rise. That's the same as just happened. A rise in energy prices, and um, we're now they're still the neoliberal press are still believing the quantitative easing and also the, the furlough money that the state spent. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's out ideal, it's nonsense, it's complete nonsense. Yeah. Local authorities can subsidize housing, they can subsidize culture, services, anything they want through state subsidies. There's no need to sell bonds, there's no need for the state to sell bonds, technically. No, no, no. Well, I'm I mean, up to make that point. Yeah. They're just putting money into a reserve bank account and paying their pause, isn't it? See, the big bond yeah. over The bank. Cor cor corporate welfare, mate. Yeah, that's what I'm after, is it? So, a uh, couple, 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 couple of final, uh, couple of final uh, questions, because we've gone on longer than I thought, actually, uh, but uh, it's really fascinating. I just wanted to ask you what... what <laughs> the nice thing... No, 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 no criticism. It's been really, really interesting. Uh, I just wanted to ask you one more point and get your thoughts about and just one more... Uh, uh, Point from the the ten point um, the program. I just want to ask you one, one more question, and and that's the um, the, the, the is number ten where the you know talk about basically giving people the the wherewithal to be able to live sustainably and to protect a, the natural environment. You know, a, a putting emphasis on on science uh, and uh, you know basically putting it at the service of of the people, as it were. Yeah. Just say a bit about that. Whether you think that's an important commitment as well. That's hugely important because, as you know, going back to the COVID epidemic, we don't know whether the government bowed to corporate pressure on vaccines or not. I sort of agree with the likes of Tom, Thomas Fatsi and then Toby Green that, that they probably did, that the vaccine program probably wasn't the best. And the herd immunity, which was mooted first, if you remember, through... Uh, I do. Yeah. But Swedes went for herd immunity. Mind you, they have a smaller population, but Again, their population tends to be packed in, into into large cities, so it's quite dense in some areas. It might have been better, okay? What we suffer from is the corporate control of research and findings. If if a corporation, and this is, you know, any, anyone who works in a university who's, uh, 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 you know, well, it's better for me because I'm retired, they can't sack me or, or, or discipline me. But anyone who works in the university can see that the, the corporate pressure on, on, on research. Yeah. Certain drugs work and, and, and certain drugs don't. Uh, and uh, energy, the argument over green energy, uh, you know, all the rest of it, uh, these re research is corrupt. And it's corrupted by the fact that it's funded by corporations. So in a healthy research environment would be state subsidiary. Yeah. Universities must be given the research funding to get on with the job and, and to produce honest, reliable findings. And, yeah. uh, that, you know, if we could do that, I mean, that would be the, the academic holy grail. But all that there's ideological corruption in all university departments. They're singing from specific hymn sheets. Sometimes <clears throat> they're singing from the hymn sheet you like, but that's wrong as well. They're doing, yeah, no, I do, no. they're doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. You've got yeah. to do the right thing for the right reasons. For the right reasons, yeah. yeah. The connection between, you know, between morality and practice. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, to clean up the university system and to get corporate funding out of universities, and, of course, a lot of research um, done in universities funded by outside bodies, by trusts. Take the American system, for instance, the two biggest funders of um, social scientific research, American social science, most of which is, I try to think of the plight, but a little late on it. It's funded by the Rockefeller and Ford Foundations. Now, they pretend not to have agendas. Oh, but come on. You know, we, we never have agendas. 
And we know that they funded identity politics from after 1968, when they saw the troubles in France and thought, oh, we don't want another revolution in Europe. We don't want class struggle in Europe. Let's fund identity politics instead. So the whole university system started talking about sexuality, gender, race, ethnicity, regionality, and all of these things, anything but class. So no, that's, that, that's something you've covered again in your book, isn't it? Yeah, yeah Simon Winlow, my, my uh, writing part, he, he's at the TR, there's a purely about that, and he, he knows his stuff better than I do on that one, he's, because he's still in the, in the business. I feel sorry for him, but he's, he's still in the business. And, and um, he, ha he has to battle through it, but he battles through with a great deal of, 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 of integrity. I, I, you know, yeah, there's one person I have huge respect for, Sam. Just, um, just uh, and ultimately, then I was going to say a couple of questions, but just uh, something else. Just I just need to uh, get your thoughts on. I mean, as we've gone through the ten point plan, there's an absence of identity politics, yeah, uh, and, and very much a return to the kind of you know economic sort of as it were bread and bread and butter. Just say the word to you why you think that's important. Well, I think that's hugely important because I think I, 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 you know, I, I think identity is hugely important, and I think that racial discrimination, discrimination on any grounds, is a bad thing that we need to eliminate. But really, without some control over the economy, what have we got to offer anyone? Well, what have we got to offer? We say, oh. You're free from discrimination now. Is that going to get all loads of black kids off the dole in, in central London? Of course it isn't. It's, it's, it's nonsense. It's what, you know, it's this abstract. It's Jürgen Habermas, the, the, the German intellectual, had a, had a sort of um, a way of <laughs> expressing this by saying, what identity politics, what cultural politics in general does is give people abstracts. So it's like saying, he has a license to drive a car. And then, you know, you turn around and say, thanks for the license, but I can't afford a car. I've got one. Yeah. yeah. But there's no point in giving people a license to drive a car unless cars are being produced. You can afford to, to, to get it and drive them. Yeah. So unless we have control of, of the economic you know, base, we haven't anything concrete to offer any. I would like, yeah. to make, I would like to end all discrimination, but what we get instead is this competitive Amble up the greasy pole, yeah? And if yeah. someone, if one identity group starts climbing up the greasy pole, you can make, you can bet your bottom dollar that there's another identity group getting pushed down. So you get all of its reaction and, 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 and it, it causes hostility. It just reproduces it. It causes and reproduces host, hostility between identity groups. I remember the sociological studies in, in, in um, the 1960s and 70s of places like Longbridge and and other older works, and uh, immigrants were moving in, coming in, and then when they're sitting on an assembly line, they're standing, so, so they're sitting in the canteen, the assembly line, you start talking, you realize you've got the same problems. Whether you're a Muslim or, 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 or a Jew or a Christian or whatever, you have the same problems. Oh, I've got a leaky boiler, you know, do, do, do you know where you get a good uh, pruller anywhere, you know, and uh, oh, God, the kids are complaining about their own work. And you start realizing we're, we're all human, we're saying we share the same problems. We don't wear different hats, worship different gods, but we're basically at that level, at the basic level of material existence and social existence, we share similar problems, and those problems can be solved in a in a in a, in a universal and shared way. But once we yeah. think, once identity becomes more important than our common existence, then you start getting big trouble, yeah. and we will have big trouble over in. Israel at the moment. That was identity is so important. Yeah. And of course, the intelligent uh, Jewish um, intellectuals uh, uh, and politically active Jews know that, and they're protesting against the, the genocide of Gaza. Because they, they know that once you start, it's what Theodora Dolo's Jewish himself called identity thinking. It's just very, very dangerous. And it causes hostility. It's simply a way of reorganizing competition. That's all, that's all it is. And it does nothing to, to, to level th anything out. It does nothing to, um, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to reproduce this idea that we have a, we have a shared life together. Yeah. Finally then, uh, Steve, I mean, there's going to be a general election next year. Uh, do you think that the Workers' Party has a chance of making an electoral breakthrough with the programme that we've been talking about this evening? 
Well, as long as you don't put people like me who ramble on for hours of talking nonsense, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, I think that I think that it's going to look. We all know it's going to be tough. We all know that we're a marginal party and that we need um, to make inroads in the electoral system. But things are going to change over the next few years. More and more people are understanding now that, and like I said before, there's a there's sort of between 60 and 70 percent of the population would, would nationalise rail, would nationalise energy. What we need to do is, is get past the media blockade. And that's the problem, media censorship. And when you talk about media before, we didn't get onto that point, but we should have done. We get at the point that media censorship is, is horrendous. And there are some parties and there are some political groups who are dismissed as populists. And dis we suffer, Chris, in this country from incompetence, as, as well as the wrong politics. Even if we have the right politics, we don't have the people to put them into practice. I don't know if you saw the documentary and uh, uh, the report, I think it was done by the BBC, on Dominic Cummings and Boris Johnson's antics during the... Uh, yeah. yeah. In, see, I'm, I'm in general against the idea of hierarchy, but there's one hierarchy I believe in, and there's only one hierarchy we should have, and that's a competence we need people. You've got a squad of builders. You need you need the master builder at the top share and the apprentices what to do. Yeah? We need yeah. competence hierarchy. We need competent politicians. We once had competent or reasonably competent politicians. Some of them were competent. Like some of them were, yeah. Some of them were. Uh, but we need more competent politicians. The convey public school Oxbridge conveyor belt, where they go through this PPE program. Have you heard of that politics? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, they're actually all gone. I mean, I did add balls and the rest of them, you know, were graduates. Yeah. Politics, philosophy, and economics in three years. Yeah. And then they yeah. set about to run the country, and you get Cameron, you get Johnson. They've all been through this. this city yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And they're very assured, and they're very, well, they, well Johnson's certainly not eloquent, either, but they're very assured, very confident, and they talk in the right way. And, and yeah. believe them, and, and, and but they're, they're totally incompetent. We saw that the, the uh, Cummings was the most competent of them all, and that's that. That really shows it. About the rest of them, you know. I mean, I so yeah. you're, we need competence. Yeah. We need working class representation. We need the most competent people chosen from any class group, any cultural group, to be running this country with a, a, people who have an understanding of, of the economics, have fiat money and economies work who have the, the interests of the working people of this country at heart, and we need to completely refurbish the, 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 the political system. We need new blood. There's a lot of those people in the Workers' Party, and if we can show knowledge and competence, if we can demonstrate to people that we know what we're talking about, uh, then you never know we might start getting somewhere, and we also might start attracting more people to the party. Yeah, we do. Well, look, on that note, on that rallying cry, thanks very much indeed, Steve, for your thoughts this evening. Really, really uh, interesting. Uh, I'm sure our audience have found them uh, fascinating and indeed inspiring. One final uh, point, though, is where can people follow your work, Steve? Are you on social media? How can we uh, people keep up to date with what you're up to? Well, I'm not, actually, because um, uh, I left Twitter. Oh, did you? Uh, right. I did, yeah. Um it was just too much, you know. I mean, can, can people can people follow you anywhere? Have you got a website or anything like that? Follow Simon Winlow. Simon Winlow. Okay, that means the man. I'll be rejoining Twitter soon. Yes. That's the man name. I right. am. Um, when I can learn to um, be less bad. To... <laughs> well, indeed, mate. Yeah, that's a, that's that's a challenge with when, when you listen to some or when you read some of the nonsense and so on. So, I mean, oh. let's just see. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your thoughts this evening and uh, welcome on board uh, with the Workers' Party. You'll be a fantastic asset for the Workers' Party as we build our movement and grow our party and hopefully make that political breakthrough that we've just spoken about there. Thanks, everybody, for watching this evening. We'll be back next week at the same time, all being well. So until then, this is Chris Williams to say bye for now. <laughs>